Hi, welcome back. Today we're going to be looking at World War I on the home front. So how does the United States and its people change due to our year and a half of engagement during World War I? And just from the pictures on the screen, you can see that women are working outside of the home in much greater numbers. Um, in this time period in lots of different professions. We're going to also see that African Americans are going to be called upon once again um, to show their commitment and patriotism um, to the United States. And we're also going to see that the U.S. government is going to have to take those advertising techniques that have been so well utilized during the late 19th century, early 20th century, to facilitate consumerism and redirect them for the purposes of persuading the civilian population and its military population to behave in certain ways in order to successfully bring World War I to a close. So in 1917, when the United States entered World War I, there was an understanding that we were going to need a large military force. Um, at the height of the war, in terms of the engagements that were going on in Europe, um, the statistic was about 50,000 men a week were either wounded or killed um, in the large engagements, particularly in France um, on the Western Front. And so we were going to need literally millions of men potentially to serve. Who knew how long the war would go on? The Selective Service Act was created because in previous wars, either we had an entirely volunteer force, you saw that in the War of 1898, the Spanish-American War. But when we go back to the Civil War, we see that volunteerism didn't get very far. By late 1862, it was necessary to have a draft, what we call conscription. And unfortunately, during the Civil War, one could simply pay for a substitute, $300 if you had it. That was a lot of money then. That was several years of income for an average American. But rich people didn't have to go and fight. The poor had no choice. And it created all kinds of problems, including those draft riots that we studied in 1863. And so the U.S. government decided to approach World War I with what they called selective service. Every man, 18 years to 35 years of age had to go and register. And then from there, they called people up, they did medical examinations and decided who they would be taking um, for the various positions, whether it be a combat role or something else, but how you would be serving in the military in that time. There were still plenty of people who voluntarily joined, but by the time the war concludes in 1918, there were more than 5 million American men um, who had been um, registered and begun the, at least the process of training um, with the U.S. Army. Women are going to be allowed to join the military at this time, and it's going to be in what they called auxiliaries. So the Navy and the Army um, will both have non-combat positions for women. Some of that will be involving nursing. Others will be the more clerical type of work to free up, again, men to fight. And then African Americans will also um, be not only um, encouraged to join, but in some cases, in some states drafted, what will more likely than not happen for most of those African-American troops is they will be in non-combat positions as well. So acting as drivers, stevedores, um, moving goods and supplies, but about 400,000 African-Americans do serve um, on active duty during World War I. Um, and some of those will actually face combat. The gentlemen who are in the upper right-hand portion of my screen, um, they were the 369th Regiment out of New York City, known as the Harlem Hellfighters. And they came to France after nearly a year of training, ready to fight, but being told they wouldn't have to fight. However, um, their unit came under fire, although they were in a non-combat position, and they prevailed on that day. Um, and were able to take out a very important German position and were elevated to combat troops as a result and continue to serve with distinction. Um, they also culturally are a very important group of people. Um, they had many musicians in their group and when they arrived in France, um, they played jazz. And it's one of the first times that Europeans will begin to see that uniquely American musical culture. Um, even after the war, many of these men um, ended up staying in France, at least for some period of time, um, recorded music, 
Um, and really were able to see that the prejudices of America were not necessarily the prejudices everywhere. In France, they were not called Negro, they were not referred to as Black, but they were simply called American. So how do you get the entire country to fight a war? And who can go and fight directly? And who's going to be supporting that effort? That idea of total war, and again, we saw this as we looked um, during the um, Civil War era. And in that term, it was really about taking the war to the people. Essentially, how do you bring your adversary to its knees? Because you bring the war to the civilian population. This time, total war is really going to be about utilizing the systems and people and structures that pre-exist, but gearing them towards the war effort. Um, so in terms of the government financing a war, because wars are expensive, they're going to have four different what they call liberty bond drives. They're going to increase taxes um, because they need money in order to fight the war. And you can see our advertisement here that essentially is trying to guilt you if you had someone you know sacrifice their life um, or be willing to sacrifice their life to go fight in France. Well, the very least you could do is go buy a liberty bond to support them. They also created something called the War Industries Board. And this was an organization, a bureaucracy that was going to take the scientific management of Taylorism and apply it to manufacturing, again, for the war effort. So places like the Ford Motor Company that were producing cars, we needed them to produce trucks. We needed them to produce ambulances and other vehicles. Um, we are going to look at other forms of manufacturing and where necessary, like the textile industry, let's get them making uniforms. So really one of the things that they had to do was look at what already existed in terms of manufacturing and either direct it to the war effort or literally they had to take over factories and have them producing something new, particularly things like armaments, um, guns. Um, there were certainly manufacturers who could do those, but not in the volume needed um, to serve alongside 5 million men, potentially, who were going to fight overseas. Um, food. So the United States was a, a land of plenty for most. Um, but during the war, it's going to have to be a country that produces enough food for the people who are left behind. It's going to have to produce enough food for the American army to take with them um, and perhaps even provide food for our allies who are at the point of starvation. Um, after two and a half years of fighting, much of the Western breadbasket of Europe, which is France, has been torn up, has been a place of battles. And so the idea that it's not simply that we're going to feed ourselves, but the men we send overseas, there was no food for them. And so we had to figure out ways of being able to not only produce food, right, we were already mass producing food in that time, but also getting the average American in some way disengage from that food supply if possible. So the idea of victory gardens became very important. Also encouraging people in terms of the food that they did purchase not to waste it, repurpose leftovers. And those may seem like kind of simple things, but every time somebody had leftovers, made a meal go to two meals, um, grew fresh vegetables in their backyard, that was other food that could be freed up for the war effort. Women are also going to be encouraged to work in factories. Again, um, young men who might have been having those jobs prior to the war, they now are either volunteering or have been drafted into service. And so where possible, again, de-skilling, I don't necessarily need the strongest, highly skilled worker. Um, I need someone who's going to be able to do this repetitive task. Um, and so de-skilling is actually going to make it possible, at least during this period of time, for more women to enter into factory work. However, when the war ends, those men will come back for their jobs and women will be expected to leave um, and fired if they won't go. We're also going to see for unionized workers, especially those who worked in the steel industry, right, which is going to be responsible for making tanks and so many armaments that are going to be necessary for the war effort. Um, there will be an actual labor board created during this period to make sure that the unionized workers, especially in the steel industry, keep working. It's really the first time that we see the eight hour day, time and a half, um, equal pay for all who are on the floor. Um, unions can organize at will. 
the one thing they had to agree is that they would not strike. So if they did want um, better benefits or pay, that that was something that was going to be arbitrated with the war board. But the idea that you would have thousands of men walking out of a plant, refusing to work for days or weeks on end, that would be punished. Um, at least by arrest and fine. So no striking, but all the other things that unions have been asking for, particularly the American Federation of Labor, they're going to get it during the war. Socially, things are going to change in America. So America prides itself on being a land of the free. Um, we like our First Amendment, but we're going to start seeing that there's going to be some curtailments on that. We're also going to see that what people see as the news is going to be highly curated um, by the government. So there's going to be official newspaper counts um, in order to persuade people. So there's no TV or radio at this time. So we want to make sure that there's not scurrilous rumors, that people are on board, that they're hearing the same story again and again. Um, there will be a bureaucracy created called the Committee on Public Information. And they're going to write the stories that they send to the newspapers to publish. They're also going to create all kinds of pamphlets and posters um, that are pro-war, um, saying that this is a good idea, encouraging people for their service. A lot of the propaganda posters of that time come out of the CPI. But also, they're going to create and train a group of people known as four minute men. And they weren't old, always men. They could be women, too. But they were often people who would have been too old for ser military service. Um, but they would come and have meetings, usually a couple of times a week. And they would be trained and given literature so that they could either just speak on the public street and shout out the news of the day. Or they could engage other people in conversation. So they might belong to a church and at the end of the service once a week, they do their four minute presentation, um, but also that they could just speak to their neighbors. But again, you could go and talk to someone else and they would have gotten a very similar story. So it was about controlling the narrative. Um, we will look in the next lesson um, far more deeply at the phenomenon of the Great Migration. But as the United States um, prepares for war and actually was making armaments for other countries um, before we declared war ourselves, factories are going to need more workers. Um, the number of Europeans who have been coming as immigrants basically dries up in 1914 due to the war. Very little tra passenger travel on the Atlantic. And so there is a desperate need for workers. And now factories in the north are going to be looking for African-Americans who are willing to come and work. So cities like Chicago, New York City, Cleveland, Detroit, these were not cities with large African-American populations before 1915. But as a result of World War I, we will see a steady movement just in the first 15 years between 1915 and 1930. We'll see about 400,000 African-Americans um, travel and resettle permanently in these northern cities. If we continue out all the way to the 1970s, it's going to be close to 6 million people. So about half of all the African Americans living in the South in 1915-1920, um, that population will move north over the next 50 years um, and really kind of change things um, and re-alter the landscape in the United States. And again, women's suffrage, we've looked at this in our progressive era unit, but the 19th Amendment, um, the NASA was the pro-war faction of the suffrage movement. Carrie Chapman Catt told Woodrow Wilson, we'll support you. And if that means supporting the war effort, so be it. Um, but there was um, pacifists across the country who felt this was somebody else's fight. They didn't feel that we should fight at all. Um, Alice Paul herself was a Quaker, so she was an, a pacifistic advocate. Um, and that's why the women's movement split, um, because her party would not directly support the war. However, they still wanted to see the 19th Amendment become a reality. In the midst of the U.S. engaging in this global conflict, we will have a pandemic um, in many ways similar to what we've all been going through um, since last February. Um, with the beginning of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but they called it the great influenza. 
Um, and there was flu, and there's always flu every winter. But in 1918, that winter, there seemed to be a great amount of people who were getting flu and dying from it. And they were young people. Unlike COVID today, most of the people who will die from the great influenza that takes place over the course of 1918 and 1919, most of them will be between the ages of 20 and 40. So it'll be a very different population. And part of the reason that it was called the Spanish flu in its day is because the U.S. government would not allow these stories to be in the newspapers. So, and, and the same thing with Great Britain and France and Germany. And so what happened was Spanish was in, Spain was a neutral country. And so it was the first country where its newspapers were reporting on the fact that men in the trenches were dying of this mysterious flu and they would ca contract it and within hours or days be dead. Um, and their symptoms were horrific. And so one of the things that happens when you have large populations of people who move, it, you potentially open yourself up to cross-contamination, extending um, viruses far beyond um, their original location. Again, as a part of the war, we've got millions of men who have traveled. Before the U.S. even entered the war, countries like Great Britain utilized their colonies. They had people coming from Australia. Um, they had those who were um, from India, um, from various parts of Africa where there were British colonies. And these people were interacting with other people. Um, and so you, whether the flu virus itself was um, coming from somewhere else or developed within um, what people were um, passing back and forth in the trenches, um, by the time the United States arrives, um, we will see in that first winter um, of 1917 into 1918, the beginnings of flu. And then there will be a second wave um, in the following um, fall and winter, much like, again, what we've experienced over the last year ourselves. Um, many more deaths, uh, more than 50 million people, is believed, died globally because of influenza. In the United States, it's about 650,000. And the first outbreak in the United States was in Fort Leavenworth, Kansas, which was a training facility at the time. Um, and so you had people who had served overseas, come back, were involved in training, living on these bases. And they believe that's where the beginnings of the contraction within the United States and the spread began. But because the public didn't know about it, parades, concerts, people hanging out in movie theaters, this was going on for weeks, if not months, um, before people realized that they were going to have to shut down, close theaters, wear masks. Um, and also establish that there were certain protocols. People weren't going to be allowed to spit. You didn't cough in an open place because you were potentially spreading death. So the other big change, and this one will be pretty long lasting in the United States. We won't really see um, a movement to reopening, if you will, the constraints among the First Amendment and public expression until the 1950s and 60s um, and then onward. But in 1917, the U.S. government will pass an Espionage Act. As a part of going to war, it's understood that there may be nations where there are people who are spying or people within the United States who may have loyalties else elsewhere and commit acts of sabotage or do something to obstruct the war effort. And that's a very important piece of language within the, the law. They also went on to pass a Sedition and Sabotage Act. And if these names sound familiar, well, we had a Sedition Act, right, going back to 1798. Um, again, it, these are acts that are going to limit some kinds of public expression. So whether that is in print or it's being voiced aloud, um, it might prevent assembly if it's for the purposes of something that seemed to obstruct the war effort. Um, but those two laws will put a lot of people in jail and will make people silent. Um, the Socialist Party and the International Workers of the World, um, both of these groups are going to be anti-war. Um, 
in part because their attitude is that this is something that elites have chosen. It's not necessarily something of the people. Um, both of these groups had been for you know more than a decade in the United States looking towards um, something that resembled a more proletariat revolution um, and a less of the elites running things. And so when they spoke out against the war and any kind of legitimacy for the United States Congress to declare war or to mandate people work in factories where now they have to make supplies for the war. Um, Eugene Debs, as we studied um, in Unit 6, um, as a part of the IWW, its leadership, he's going to find himself in prison um, for four years um, and is so upset about these curtailments on the First Amendment that in 1920, he's going to run for president. He's not going to win, but he's going to get nearly a million votes, again, all from prison. But we're going to see about 1,500 people arrested and to some degree prosecuted. Um, and two Supreme Court cases are going to establish that there are reasonable limits on the First Amendment. So in the Schenck v. U.S. case, um, there was a group of people um, who were passing out literature, um, encouraging people to not be part of the volunteer army, to defy the draft if possible, even said that the draft technically was unconstitutional, that you can't be compelled to service. Um, and they will be arrested. And when they attempt to use the courts um, to get their freedom, the Supreme Court will be on the side of the government and say that the Espionage Act um, can stand because these people were obstructing the war effort. Um, the Abrams case, again, you had people passing out pamphlets um, that were encouraging people to, again, not participate directly in the war effort or not um, do, do work in factories that were creating supplies, ammunition, things for the war. They were also told um, you are obstructing the war effort and perhaps are actually engaging in acts of sabotage. The Abrams case is going to establish a point of law that you can have an individual be limited in terms of their First Amendment rights if what they do establishes a clear and present danger. It's where we get the old expression, you can't yell fire in a theater. Um, the Supreme Court, as a part of its case, um, a, a jurist named Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. will say that in the same way that you can't walk into a crowded theater or a concert or any place where you have a great number of people, limited exits, and yell fire when there isn't one because you cause panic and eventually perhaps harm and if not death in your actions, they said that's what these people were doing. Um, and we won't see really a, 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 re a release of those kinds of um, restrictions until the late 50s, early 60s, when people start challenging these First Amendment issues um, very directly. Um, and some of these will continue well on um, through the late 20th century. World War I, the number of people who died, it's astronomical. Um, and these are just people that are battlefield deaths. This is not looking at, um, you know, people who would have died, um, civilians who would have been negatively impacted. Um, this is just people who were part of the military in their country. And if you look at these numbers, you can see that Germany and Russia, the number of lives lost is incredible. Um, Russia drops out of the war. Um, by the beginning of 1917, and 1.7 million people died. This is not even including the number of people who were injured in some way. Um, Germany, who fights the full course of the war, 1.7 million people. France, 1.3. Um, Great Britain and its colonies, because the empire was asked to go and serve, um, nearly a million people. The now defunct Austro-Hungarian Empire, 1.2 million. Why does this matter? Well, because when you look at the number for the United States, it's about 107,000. And it's important to note that about half of that number are people who died because of disease, in particular the flu. 
So only about 56,000 men who served in combat died. That's going to really shape things for how do we create peace to come? How do we end the war? Because for the United States, and certainly for Woodrow Wilson, he saw hope. He saw that there was an opportunity for peace. But for our nations that had lost large amounts of their population, and literally in a place like France or Russia or Germany, what that meant was out of one out of every three young men between the age of 16 and 40 died. It's, it's a tremendous loss to the population. And so World War I in its time was called the Great War. And people said it's the war to end all wars. And obviously we know World War II is to come. So that was not the case. But so many people died. Such destruction was unleashed, um, not only in Europe, but elsewhere, that people said this can't ever happen again. Woodrow Wilson, in January of 1918, decides that he's not just going to simply write a letter, his annual address. He's going to show up. And he is going to deliver in person to both houses of Congress his plan for the future. And he called it the 14 points. He believed that there were 14 things that every nation on earth could agree to that you would have no more war. Perhaps that is a bit naive or maybe it's thinking outside the box. But he won't get people to agree to all 14. And perhaps that's why it's not as successful as he hopes it will be. But he, long before the war ends, the war ends in November of 1918, he is arguing that this is what needs to happen post-World War I. There was an armistice on November 11th, 1918, which meant people put down their weapons. People could return home. But there was no brokered long-term peace. And there had been no actual decisions about, essentially, was there a winner or a loser? That will be decided at Versailles. So in 1919, Woodrow Wilson and leaders from dozens and dozens of countries, plus other people who might not have been running their country, but might have had an interest in a new world order, came to Versailles. And over the course of six months, they came to an agreement, which is known as the Treaty of Versailles. And the Versailles Conference, what was very troubling is that upon arrival, the German contingent realized that there was no one directly representing the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Their last king had died in 1918. Um, Italy, who had been one of their allies as the war began, changed sides halfway through, and they're now hanging with Great Britain and France. Russia is not even a part of this because they created their own separate peace with Germany in 1917. And the German contingent is basically told things will be decided and we will bring you back to the conference when those decisions have made, been made. So the German contingent didn't actively participate in the Versailles conference. On top of that, Germany is left to hold the blame because there are other partners in this conflict. Italy's trade sides. The Austro-Hungarian Empire no longer has leadership. The Ottoman Empire no longer has leadership. Um, it's just them alone. Their king, Kaiser Wilhelm II, who was seen as one of the instigators of this entire conflict, he's been banished. He's living in Holland <laughs> um, for the rest of his life um, and not part of this um, negotiation. So you have uh, essentially a a provisionary government who has sent leadership that has no real power and people who have been scorned, who have been deeply hurt and who are representing populations of people who want, in some cases, revenge are set deciding what's going to happen next. So as he arrives in France, one of the things that Woodrow Wilson wants to do is create a body that is going to represent member nations that can hopefully prevent war or stop what were these secret alliances amongst the various powers, what he calls the League of Nations. And although we will get the League of Nations, and certainly our president is seen at the time as being um, a major change agent in what becomes the Treaty of Versailles, 
Congress doesn't sign it. Congress, the Senate, won't agree to be a part of the League of Nations, and they won't sign the Treaty of Versailles because they find flaw in it. And that will be really the legacy of Woodrow Wilson, that he wanted to create something that would be a long-lasting peace, but the price that the United States would have to pay to be part of that peace, and the fact that this was going to be a peace that was rather tenuous, based on blaming Germany outright for the entire war, forcing a reparations payment of $47 billion in their money, not our money today, um, it was just seen as, as, as ridiculous. And the United States Senate said they wouldn't be a part of it. This political cartoon, I think, does a really good job of showing that from the perspective of other nations, the United States was seen as essential to the legitimacy of the League of Nations. Um, Uncle Sam here is sitting on this keystone, right? We're the ones who are talking about building this bridge, but Uncle Sam is not putting that keystone, which structurally is necessary for that bridge, that arch to last and be functional. And the U.S. can't get to that place. And the American public is going to be split over this issue as well. So it's not simply going to be something that the Senate and the president are arguing against. It's going to be that you have three very specific factions. You have what are called the Wilsonians. And these are people who believe in Wilson's idea and say, sign it and belong. And through influence and time, the things we don't like can be changed. But it's better to simply belong, that that's the path forward. There were reservationists, and those were people who said, here's the one problem we see with this. There's something called Article X, Article 10, and it requires that anyone who belongs to the League of Nations gives up their own personal national sovereignty to declare war, and that war is declared by the members of the League. So if one of the League members is attacked by some other nation that's not a part of the League, then all the other countries in the League are to go to war on behalf of this country that's been victimized, been invaded, attacked. And they said, the U.S. can't do that. One, we have this long tradition of no foreign entanglements, but literally it's a power of our Senate to sign treaties. It is Congress's power to declare war, not our president. And one of the things that probably Wilson didn't make clear at the time, and people didn't really kind of pay attention to it, is that you could be the prime minister of Great Britain. Um, that's who's represented in this picture here, David Lloyd George. You could be the um, you know president of France. That was uh, Monsieur Clemenceau here. Um, but you could sign these agreements pretty easily um, and they would be lasting. You could be the broker for these kinds of things. Woodrow Wilson, as the president of the United States, didn't actually have that power. And so Congress was very concerned, particularly the Senate, um, about what was the covenant of the League of Nations and this actual Versailles Treaty and just said, we have to amend these things if we're going to sign it. And then you had a group of people called the Irreconcilables. Um, and those individuals said, no treaty, no league ever. And in the end, they will win out because they will be able to persuade public opinion to such a degree that even those who are reservationists believe that they're not going to get an amended treaty. And so if it's not simply a choice of an amended treaty, but a treaty or no treaty, they decide for no treaty. And again, it comes back to this idea that, you know, American foreign policy from 1789 to 1914 was basically one for the most part of certainly no foreign entanglement, but also by the time we get to the 1820s and certainly through the Spanish-American War era, it, it's the view that we're going to police what we see in our hemisphere, but we're not going to somehow give up any kind of... Um, sovereignty when it comes to decisions about making war or entering into military conflicts. And that ultimately is what derails the League of Nations. Um, we have an artist here who's been a little funny, um, but we have two people who are about to get married.
Um, and we have this lovely woman here who has foreign entanglements written on her bridal gown. She represents what will be the League of Nations um, and this Versailles Treaty. And Uncle Sam is the groom and he's sweating. He's looking a little bit nervous, um, doesn't know if this is what he wants to commit to. Um, the minister who represents the League really wants to see this couple seal the deal. Um, but the U.S. Senate is going to come crashing in and break up that that um, potential marriage before anybody can say I do. So as we close out, I want you to think about really five things. The first one is how did life change for Americans at home? It, it will be radically different from 1917 to 1919 than it had been um, before in American history. So the average American. What would their life be like during that time period? The changes that came about as the U.S. mobilized, why did they happen? What happened exactly in order to get our population geared for war? Why did the Versailles Treaty feel, fail? What were its flaws, according to its critics? And then also isolationism is going to become the du jour policy of the United States in the 1920s and 30s as a reaction to World War I, the loss of life, and this failed Versailles Treaty. Um, and so we have to keep going back to this idea of neutrality um, and isolationism. Are they one and the same or are they different things? Um, and is there a price to be paid by making those choices? And then the last one is how was entering the fight and negotiating peace at the end of World War I diplomacy based on the ideology of American exceptionalism? So as we enter the war, and certainly as the war concludes, the development of this Treaty of Versailles potentially are belonging to the League of Nations. How is that continuing this idea of American exceptionalism that's become so important? in the era that we're studying currently.